When we're in Yellowstone, one of the things that I'm going to have you do is to take a look at regrowth as a result of the fires in 1998. And so uh, to prepare you for that, hopefully you'll enjoy this little bit on fire succession and fire forest fires. So in order um, for us to appreciate fires, we have to remember what the forest looks like now. This is a fairly typical lodgepole forest, which are the types of forests that we have in Yellowstone Park. And as you can see, there's some undergrowth, there's some grass growing down there, there's some mature trees and shorter, smaller trees. And that's pretty typical of what you see in the park. And so um, when we get down there, you'll be able to see that this is what it looks like. And so just keep in mind that that's the way it was prior to the forest fires coming in. Another thing about lodgepole forests is over the years, especially in a place like Yellowstone Park where they don't allow people to go in and get firewood or cut the wood down for, for lumber, then we end up with a lot of dead trees in the forest. And you can see from this picture right here, that's exactly what's happened. And so we call that dead, those, that dead material forest litter and it provides a great fuel source for the fires once the fire has a chance to get started. You're aware that more than likely naturally caused fires are from lightning and we also know that forest fires are caused by people but generally speaking in Yellowstone Park most of the fires that occur are lightning caused fires. So in order to have a fire you really need three conditions. Uh, if you take a look at this chart right here, you need fuel, which you see at the bottom, which we've already talked about how that accumulates over the years because in a place like Yellowstone, we don't have control and people are not allowed to go in and get the firewood. We have heat from a lightning source and we have air and oxygen around us. And so those three conditions create what we call the fire triangle. And so if all three of those conditions are met, then a forest fire begins. One of the things that's pretty interesting about the Yellowstone area is that there is a quite a historical record about forest fires. And this is a diagram or a picture actually of a tree, probably um, a tree not that, that's not a lodgepole, more than likely something like a Douglas fir tree, which there are some in Yellowstone Park. And I've actually seen some trees that display the same kind of evidence. But you can see each place that there's one of those arrows is, an, is a place on the tree as it was growing that it encountered a fire. Some trees like Douglas firs have a really thick bark system to them and so if there's a ground fire or other fires around them oftentimes that fire is not able to penetrate that bark system but it does scar the bark so it's blackened and as the next year's growth comes along it just covers up that blackened scarred um, place on the bark and just end up with um, that scar being inside the growth rings and so you can see from this picture right here that this particular tree um, experienced quite a number of fires during its life. So again there's historical evidence of fires in Yellowstone Park. In 1988 was the year that the huge fires hit Yellowstone and you can see from this map where they actually took place and the areas that they affected and you can see that a great majority of the park actually was affected by the fires and the fires weren't confined only to the borders of the park they moved outside the park as well so one of the things that's really cool about lodgepole trees is the pine cone that they produced is really interesting take a look at that image at the bottom on the left hand side that's a fairly typical lodgepole pine cone and you'll notice that all the bits of it are kind of glued together. They're all stuck together. This is what we call a serotonous pine cone. That means that the sap of the cone actually holds all of those individual components of the pine cone together. In the middle picture, you can see how those pieces of the cone have actually split apart. Well, the force that causes those to split apart is fire. So as the fire, a forest fire comes through an area of lodgepole trees, the heat from the fire melts the sap that's holding the pine cone together. And as those, uh, that, that sap melts, it releases the seeds that are stuck in between each one of those little bracts of the, of the cone itself and releases those seeds onto the, the floor of the forest. 
Some of those seeds get burned up. You can see on that upper right hand corner that the, sometimes those cones actually get burned totally up. But most of the time, many of the, much of the time, those seeds are released down into the forest floor where now the forest has been cleared of its undergrowth, all the extra dead trees are out of the way, some of the plants on the ground have been burned away, like the grasses and shrubs and things like that. So it makes a really nice environment for those seeds to begin to germinate. And that's exactly what happens. Then, as those new trees begin to grow, we go through a period of what we call succession. If you take a look on the left hand side, what tends to happen is we have different plants that are what we call dominant or predominant at certain stages of succession. On the left hand side we have weeds that begin to come in right after a forest fire and then the next step is grasses that uh, start right away and they're able to grow and then shrubs are next, and then finally the pine forest. In this diagram, I actually cut it off because it went on to a hardwood forest, but in Yellowstone, it actually stops at the pine forest. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that each one of those stages, at the weed stage, and the grass stage, and the shrub stage, the trees are still there, but they're really small. And so they're getting established. They're not the dominant plant at that stage, but eventually they rise above everything else and they become the dominant plant eventually in the succession of the forest. So when we get down to the park, uh, we're going to take a look at an area that was burned in 1988. So some of the questions we're going to ask ourselves while we're down there are, so what's happened to that area in 33 years? And what can we expect in the future as we take a look at that environment and we know that uh, we are susceptible to forest fires? Will there be another fire? And we'll begin to ask questions like that. One of the ways we'll do that is to use what we call a Daubenmeyer frame. And it is a just basically some plastic tubing. And then we're going to put that on the ground and we're going to take a look at the plants that are actually growing inside of that frame, get an idea of the growth that's in there. And then we'll take some measurements and collect some data. We'll be taking a look at for plants like Forbes, which are flowering plants. We'll take a look at the bare ground. We'll estimate how many trees are in that Daubenmeyer frame area. We'll estimate grasses, forest litter, and losses, mosses and lichens. Then we'll put all that information together. And I actually have data from uh, the last 20 years when my middle school students have done this similar activity. And when we get back to class after the trip, we'll take a look at some of that data and see if we can make sense of what's going on. So that's the uh, plan. That's the activity. Should be fun uh, time to go down and see what we can learn about that.